Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the International Conference on Design Futures. Um, can you hear me? Are you all prepared? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to International Conference on Design Future. 欢迎大家 ，the doctoral student of Tsinghua University.、Uh, this evening, we will have two keynotes and one panel. Now,、uh, let's come to the first keynote given by Professor Fu Zhiyong. Who is the associate professor and doctoral supervisor of、mm. Institute of Information Art and Design at Academy of Art and Design, Tsinghua University, and he is the vice director of China Italy Design Innovation Hub、mm. at Tsinghua University. Now let's welcome、mm. Professor Fu. And now, I'm going to share with you my keynote speech. Because of the time difference, we're going to arrange the speeches of the Europe in the afternoon and the speech from the North America. In the evening, so we're going to have a lot of、uh, speakers from、uh, America in the evening. My topic is from design thinking to future thinking, foresight and this、uh, changing. I'm from the Fan Art School of Tsinghua University. Our speeches of、uh, the Europe in the, the afternoon and、uh, the speech from the、uh, North America、uh, in the afternoon. Christopher talked about the book that he worked with me.、Uh, And、uh, today, my presentation will fall into three parts. The first is、uh, from design thinking to future thinking, ignite diversified value speculation. The second is、uh, integrated futures thinking into design education, cultivate、uh, reflective practitioners. The third is from future design to design futures, and、uh, to lead our action. Future studies is、uh, a branch of sociology. It comprehensively study the future trends, the possible scenarios, challenges, and、uh, the countermeasures in the major areas of、uh, humankind. And、uh, it pays more attention to the complicated and the macro system. In, there are a lot of、uh, developments in this area, and we want to apply those、uh, methods to our design future thinking. As we can see, that the future here、um, is in plural. It reflects our opinions on the future. There, it is diversified.、Uh, there are a lot of、uh, possibilities. It is a process of uh, uh, creative exploration. It、uh, applies different uh, uh, scenarios to find the possible solutions and、uh, recognize the uncertainties. <coughs> Jim Data、uh, believes that、uh, the future cannot be predicted, but、uh, alternative futures can and should be forecast. The future, the preferred future, can be、uh, envisioned,、uh, invented, implemented, and、uh, continuously evaluated, revised, and re-envisioned. This uh, is uh, the very important uh, symbol of uh, 
such as studies. This is a part of the logo of our conference. From now to the future, there are many different possibilities and the possible futures, plausible futures. Uh, which means that it should be able to uh, should able to happen and uh, but uh, limited by condition uh, con various conditions and uh, we uh, want to have a preferred futures <clears throat> and uh, uh, there are uh, four alternative futures growth transformation constraints and uh, collapse and this is a way for us to describe the development of future and this is the study uh, we put future into different uh, uh, visions to see uh, the, uh, the the um, all kinds of uh, possibilities and uh, also we divide the thinking of uh, uh, future into six pillars, including mapping, uh, anticipating, timing, and deepening, creating alternatives, and uh, realize transformation. These are all the, the foundations for the future study. On the website of UNESCO, we can see the, the new concept, the futures literacy. Futures literacy is uh, the study of uh, forecasting how, uh, why we need to use the future. Uh, we can decide the, uh, the imaginable future. It can be used, it can be created. We can use different uh, ways to uh, use it. This is a framework of UNESCO. And I, for us to uh, th uh, think about uh, how to develop the future literacy. And this is a laboratory of future literacy. And uh, this uh, practice has been implemented in different parts of the world, including the uh, behavior study and uh, uh, the action research, action learning, and to study the future and design the future. These are the foundations for the study of futures, and we want to look at the future from the perspective of design. We are not trying to forecast it. We want to create the future. The best way to forecast the future is to create the future. The first uh, opinion is from design thinking to futures thinking. After uh, Simmons uh, design uh, defined the design from the perspective of uh, science, he believed that everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations. And uh, the development of design thinking, thinking to future thinking, science way of thinking, uh, designers' ways, uh, etc. And uh, this is a timeline for the design thinking development. We can see from this chart, uh, from Herbert to Simon to Brian uh, Lawson, Nelson Krauss to uh, the, the ideal. This is a timeline <clears throat> from traditional design to design thinking to computational design. It handles uh, the mobile computation and the cutting edge technology. The systemic thinking is uh, the study of a bigger picture, and uh, it studies uh, the possibilities of the future, and uh, design thinking is uh, the, the process of creation. These are the five steps of design thinking, and uh, what are the differences between design thinking and the future th thinking? And from this map, we can see that design thinking start from the reality and uh, through observation, insights, needs, define ideas, concepts, 
prototype and the product. This is a process of the designing. The futures thinking emphasizes on the trends. Then they find the trends, they find the signals, find the drivers and the forecast and uh, describe the diversified future. There are uh, different uh, artifacts to present the possible future world. And in the past, it's uh, the object of centered, then user centered, and society centered. And now it is more em emphasizing on the nature, nature oriented and future centered. It put forward the questions and come up with the possible solutions. We see that the future thinking intervenes in the fields of industrial design, human computer interaction. We just released the blue paper in various areas. Uh, including the human machine interaction, there may be possibilities of application of for futures thinking. This is a future laboratory. This is a workshop of uh, the catalog. They uh, have uh, the design fiction to constitute uh, the catalog of the future products. The, the products are not uh, in existence now, but we have the internet technology to support the development and uh, realization of those products. With this way, we can see that we can use a very vivid way the fiction to display the non-exist future and we can express our ideas and communicate with others. There are many uh, the resources about design fictions. And this is uh, the Internet of Things uh, company. They, we saw the catalog of the first company and there are many uh, cases. Design fiction is uh, the storytelling process. With the storytelling, we can describe the, our needs and, and our vision for the future. There are many case studies. In the Human Machine Interaction International 2020, there was a session uh, designing the future's innovative theories, tools, and practices. We wanted to uh, turn our research into the tools to guide our actions. We introduced one paper about envisioning the future scenarios. Uh, from the perspective of uh, the paper, we wanted to find a possible way and methodologies so that uh, design fiction uh, can be applied to the interactive design and service design to cope with the problems in the uh, uh, society and in the city so that uh, we can uh, shift our focus on the possibilities in the future and we can use the design fictions to, uh, uh, to use its narrative advantages to display the the energetic prototype to uh, generate this object with uh, the narrative and the discussion, we can realize it. One important aspect is fiction is uh, fact. With uh, the f uh, we can constitute the future uh, from the fact, and uh, we can uh, explore the future uh, from the fiction and. Uh, the science fiction is a very creative artifact too, and we use this set of tools to help those who are trying to create the future. First of all, we need to establish our uh, world view with the support of a series, and uh, then we explore the scenario when AI is uh, in, uh, in a scenario, and 
What would be the、uh, players? Whether it is the real person or the artificial person who participate in it, and also by means of certain tools, props or metaphor, we will present the content and also generate the system map. So a series of、uh, tools would help us to envision the future. Here we have、uh, a Chinese version of the example we just mentioned. So first,、uh, we set up the、uh, world view for the future, the outlook. There are some、uh, theoretical bases, like the theories about uncertainty. Then we'll see the impact of、uh, this、uh, increase or decrease of、uh, therapy, and then the scenario like、uh, Eden. We can see the、uh, story develops in different、uh, scenarios. For example, a painter expresses his、uh, view on life and art. And also, we have other scenarios. For example, to relax, and also there's the entry to the next session. So this is、uh, the design of our、uh, postgraduate student who establish、uh, various、uh, personas and、uh, metaphors. For example, Eden is、uh, seen as、uh, the counseling room, and also we have、uh, the crown symbolizing the EEG testing instrument. In our education, this kind of method is being more and more widely used, so that the students will better、um, evaluate the values and the world outlook, and then we put it into this virtual environment. This is、uh, the exhibition. We could experience the change of the EG and also help to counsel the emotions. This is our envision of the future and step by step. We implement the design project. Speculative design, 就是思辨设计。This is not only about like a native design or others, because we not only have envisioning, but also implement the design process. 那进一步呢，我们也 Furthermore, in our course, we have done a lot of a survey. So we believe with this、uh, design fiction, with interaction, we could、uh, well inspire the student, and also through this way, we could get、uh, better innovation results. Second, integrate future thinking into design education, cultivate、uh, reflective practice. Here we need to put forward the questions. For example, how does future thinking enhance the cultivation of a thinking ability in design teaching? Second, how to use speculative design as a means of cultivating reflective practitioners? And also, based on that. How does future thinking provide inspiration and reference for the development of the design teaching? These are the issues we would like to discuss. Design futures. This concept we hope could focus on exploring the impact of short-term and long-term futures on the current society, leading industrial transformation and social evolution through future thinking and designing a more desirable future with co. Um, creative um, thinking. 
And we have uh, such a slide to show the differences for um, speculative design. We emphasize the critical thinking supported by problem and scenarios. While design fiction is emphasized in a relative experiment with a um, gigantic uh, prototype. Well, design futures is more about the reflective practice, which uh, have a product and uh, service output in the end to promote industrial development. The reason we put forward the concept is, of course, related to the uncertainties caused by the pandemic. So we are shifting from uh, sure of the future to full of uncertainty, which is a wicked problem. If we don't resolve these uh, wicked problems, we will face even bigger troubles. So when we try to solve it, we need to have uh, innovative uh, and uh, open methods or open innovation, no matter it is a platform for innovation or workshop. How could we better use the design tools? Like we have uh, set up a series of uh, tools for the future. The most widely used is uh, like this. We first identify the opportunities, then conceptualize, then the presentation of the result. So with the COSI framework, we jointly develop it. It is divided into framing, scanning, filtering, visioning, designing, and uh, adapting. Through this way, we could uh, integrate the design and uh, thinking. Design thinking is uh, one part, while the future thinking will be even broader. How can we through the future uh, design to better adapt to the future? So with this kind of uh, tools, so we further configure it in design. We integrate the futures design method uh, in blue. You can see the tools for future study. We have done a lot of exploration. In the interest of time, I will not go into details of these tools. What I want to say here is we have uh, made a description of uh, each tool which after the workshop we will make open to all of you. So our professors, uh, students, uh, scholars who are interested could take advantage of them for future design. So these are our explorations during which we believe the important point is we must uh, use this kind of uh, studies to guide our practice that leads to the third part from future design to design futures. Uh, the core of a future design is a design while the essence of a design futures will be the future. How could you design multiple futures with foresight leading action now? So here, we hope that through co-creation and cross-disciplinary collaboration, we could better use the future thinking, put it into design thinking. For practice, we still need to have a interactive design and service design serve as important tool. The academic world has done a lot of uh, study on design fiction and uh, critical design future studies and design futures. Here I have uh, shown these uh, dimensions in the slide and their strategic uh, functions. Hopefully through this study, we could guide our practice. 
产生这样一个对设计未来的研究，也是因为在我们 The reason we have、uh, the concept of、uh, design future because when we were building up our disciplines, we found such a few years ago called Minority Report, which outlook the future scenario. A number of、uh, the pieces can be regarded as the prototype of today's life. The devices at that time were like this. For example, the CRV、uh, display monitoring and this、uh, flip the screen mobile phone. So,、uh, a number of、uh, IT companies are designing the future with their tools. For example, the vision of a future by Microsoft, and also we are thinking about the future possibilities. How can we use a certain pattern to、uh, build the long-term development? Uh, because the technological future may not necessarily be the future we want, so we need to have our own way of thinking. We want to put forward such a model. The first one is a、uh, year one to two will be the prototype、uh, innovation, which is called the、uh, Fab Lab. Then, a、uh, scenario innovation for year three to five. Um, previously, our expert mentioned the living lab, which is、uh, about this、uh, scenario innovation. That is、uh, for the long-term data accumulation and behavior study. And then, furthermore, the trend innovation from year five to year ten. It is about the design futures lab. At early stage, Tsinghua University has done some、um, exploration in living lab. We hope this kind of、uh, theories and practices can be combined, because、uh, living lab is a kind of、uh, um, environment, a series of、uh, tools, and also、um, innovation services, which is、uh, designed by William Michel. Important element of a living lab is the yellow circle methods and the tools. Of course, it needs the support from the environment and a cooperation. Through this way, we could、uh, connect、uh, cities and、uh, innovation, and also with the collaboration between the three research institutes and、uh, universities, we could、uh, innovate the solution. And、uh, last、uh, summer vacation, we initiated this、uh, um, design partner 3.0. The online version is called the City Hunter. Through this、uh, plan, we have recruited、uh, 41 undergraduate students from、um, 25 world-class universities around the world. Like the public space and community creation, overseeing environment and uh, culture uh, dissemination are the main topics. Within thirty days, we have a lot of discussions. We have、uh, utilized、uh, many many design tools and designed them,、um, uh, design design our own tools. And we have、uh, the online workshop and、uh, online. Um, cooperation session. We developed a tool to facilitate the collaboration between teams. And very importantly, we have、uh, linked the online offline. We connect with our offline scenario in Chengdu to have a remote empathy through、uh, live broadcasting and storytelling. Our offline team. Is、uh, linked with uh, our online discussion. So this way, we have、uh, made six designs for the future. So on the one hand, these are the visions for futures. On the other hand, we have、uh, developed new tools for、uh, design futures and also practice the. 
co-creation internationally for future thinking to design future we will take consideration of uh, society economy etc and also a uh, protocol a prototype innovation to scenario innovation and trend innovation we integrate all these factors and so that we can promote it into a, a preferable future and this is uh, a uh, quote from the uh, answer to that. She said that a design as a catalyst for social dreaming. We hope with our thinking for the future can support the uh, building of the preferable society with the study of the long-term trend. We can empower ourselves to uh, find the day mutual uh, benefiting society. We have another keynote uh, speaker, Kuno Studi, and we work together to promote they say uh, online uh, course. He will have uh, um, a longer introduction uh, in last uh, in summer of last year. We uh, discussed this uh, uh, course. Our uh, moderator Satin also participated in the discussion, and uh, with uh, our visit and uh, our conference uh, design future. So we want to further uh, establish the community of design futures and uh, to design a preferable future to cope with the uncertainties. In the coming weeks, we have another uh, exhibition in Chengdu. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor. And next, I will sh share my screen. Please wait a moment. Okay, thanks to Professor Fu again uh, for sharing about future thinking and the new trial on design education. Uh, next, we will have another keynote from Peter Skupli. Peter is a Nuremberg Association professor in design and the director of the Learning Environment Lab School of Design at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm, let's welcome Peter. Peter? Can you share a screen? Yes, yes, let me share. Okay, share. Oh, whoops. Uh, can you see my slides or my slide notes? And both your slides and your notes. <laughs> Oh, let me try this again. Uh, stop share. Oh, and this evening, after Peter's sharing, we will have another panel. So It would maybe will be a wonderful evening for us. <laughs> okay. And so you can still see my lecture notes, is that um, true? Yes, I can see your notes also. <laughs> oh boy. So let's try to share again. Did you use another device? Maybe you, uh, yes, you can shut down another device. So it can be okay. only your slide. Let's see.
Um, what about now? Can you see my slides? There's still my notes as well. Only yeah. slides. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You can on, only see work. the slides. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, um, Professor uh, Fuzi Yang and Ching, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'm super excited to be here with you and uh, even more excited that you can see my slides without my notes. Uh, the talk is titled uh, Teaching to Design Futures. I'll explain uh, design spelled with an X um, a little bit later. Um, we live in really interesting times with rapid change and much uncertainty about our collective futures. Um, there's the climate emergency. The earth is getting hotter, the storms are getting stronger. And I think the question is how might designers engage with the climate emergency more broadly? We're in the middle of a global pandemic and there's questions about how design might help to shift behavior. I think I'd be remiss not to mention that we have systemic problems such as racism and white supremacy. Um, and the question might be, how could design be harnessed to transform uh, towards an anti-racist uh, society? So the, the question is uh, where to begin and uh, what kind of design is needed um, to address these larger societal challenges. And so uh, as a design educator, I'm constantly challenged to prepare my students for the world that they're in and will be facing moving forward. Um, I'd like to say that uh, design thinking is a very powerful tool, um, but for societal level challenges, we require a broader vision of design than design thinking focused on customer needs. Um, we're in the middle of the Anthropocene. Human impact on the planet is unprecedented. And design plays a major role. We can see the impact of design everywhere around us. Uh, the design products, services, and lifestyles shape the planet's geology, ecosystems, and weather. So we need to use new thinking for new problems, but how to do that? I think the work of Tony Fry indicates a shift that's necessary from defuturing to futuring. And defuturing means doing things today that take away our collective tomorrow. Uh, defuturing is what leads us to the worst aspects of the Anthropocene, uh, whereas futuring means doing things today that give us collective futures. So to design for sustainable, resilient, and adaptive futures, one needs to be able to perceive, explore, understand, and ultimately design within much larger contexts. And uh, larger contexts bring with them uh, complexity, increased complexity. And so this, uh, it, to uh, sort of unpack this shift from defuturing to futuring, uh, there's this larger complexity that we must deal with. Uh, this is the work of Elizabeth Pastor and uh, G.K. Van Patter from Humantific. And they talk about how on a continuum of complexity, design 1.0 is designed based around the design brief. Uh, design 2.0 would be product service experience challenges based around the product service framing. Whereas uh, design 3.0 is um, organizational transformation design based on system organization and industry challenges um, around organizational problem opportunity framings. And design 4.0 could be thought of as social transformation design with country, society, and planet framed as societal uh, problem and opportunity. And I think the point that they make most importantly is that mainstream design and thinking works for design one and 2.0, but as you start to engage with design three and 4.0, there's another type of design thinking that's necessary. And I'm gonna uh, refer to the work done by Arnold Wasserman. Um, and he, he has a, a different way of looking at uh, design. And he talks about how design 1.0 is really artifact centric and design 2.0 is where design really comes in when we're focusing on human centric. Uh, problems, whereas design 3.0 is really about uh, changing the world and it's sociocentric and social innovation is sort of um, the type of design that's going on. But then he talks about a fourth kind uh, where we're, we're looking towards sustainable prosperity for all at one planet and he calls that design 4.0. And that's where I think transition design comes in to get to that societal level. Now, uh, as designers engage with these larger problems, all the levels uh, of design need to be engaged. And so 
if we look at sustainable development goals by the United Nations and designers start to work on these problems, all of a sudden you start to see how there's short-term action to try to accomplish long-term goals. And this uh, sort of helps us realize that we need new kinds of tools to work with these types of um, large societal problems. And I think there's three issues that really come up. The first is um, how to design in time. And this is where I think futures really helps us. The second is designing uh, for specific values. And so the moment in which we're talking about sustainable futures, then all of a sudden there are certain things that we have to take off the table as well. And then the third is um, scale. So designing for planetary impact. And I think futures really helps us to address these three problems. But how do we, how do, we do that? So I think the, the first step is by imagining the future that we desire and by starting to tell stories about futures. Now there's uh, certain types of stories that we're very familiar with. Um, the first might be utopia. And so this is an imagined place where everything is perfect. And the utopia came from Sir Thomas More um, when he was trying to critique the present. So he imagined this place, but the problem with utopia is it, it gets to the very meaning of the word, which is you, in Greek means non, utopia means place. So this is a place that can't happen. Uh, the opposite of utopia is dystopia. So this again is an imagined place where everything is unpleasant or bad. And dyst while dystopias make for great books and great movies, um, from a design perspective, um, we're not trying to create dystopias. Um, so I think the, the question isn't so much as if the glass is half full or half empty. We need to take on a third perspective in which we acknowledge that the glass is always full, uh, half with air and half with water. And so we explore the good and the bad together. And so this third perspective is what I think uh, futurist Jim Dater was thinking about when he was uh, talking about utopia and you in Greek means good. So he was talking about like, what is a good place? What is a preferred uh, real future that we can work towards? And so not a utopia, which cannot be, or a dystopia, which is a place we'd rather not be, but a good place that we can work our way towards. Now, the, the, to get to utopia, I think we really fundamentally need to teach designers futures. And there's a lot of work going around uh, on around the world on design futures. These are just some of the places. And in this conference, you'll hear from leaders in many of the different areas of design futures. So design fiction, uh, speculative design, um, discursive design, uh, experiential design. Um, I'm gonna talk about the work that I've been doing at Carnegie Mellon, which is a uh, design, uh, I'll explain that the, the, the X in design. And so the, the proposition is if you take a design thinking and you combine it with futures thinking, you get a new um, kind of design, which we're calling a design futures. And this idea of design with an X is, uh, was birthed by Arnold Wasserman while we were working together. We kept on talking about traditional design and uh, this new kind of design. And so Arnold uh, just said, well, why don't we call it something different if it's something different? And he came up with the uh, design with an X. Um, and you'll be hearing from Arnold uh, later in the conference. Uh, so so he'll, he'll be telling his story as well. So the, the way that we've worked on design and futures is sort of there's two main strands. Um, the first was uh, trying to work on creating a design future scenario set in year 2050. And I developed three courses um, based on that. And uh, let me tell you the story of those first three courses. So uh, let's start with uh, design the future. So um, this is the course that Arnold and I uh, developed. Um, we put all the courses, course materials online so they're there. If you wanna see them, uh, this course was taught in 2013. Uh, here are Arnold and I at the kickoff of the class. Um, Arnold spent two weeks at CMU and then the, the rest of the semester, he uh, was beamed in through video conference. Um, and here you can see the students um, 
presenting their semester long uh, 15 week uh, projects. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the projects um, that they created. So these were scenarios for the future of Pittsburgh uh, situated in year 2050. Um, the first team uh, comprised of Kate McLean, uh, Caroline Valk, Avinash Parita worked on the future of education in 2050 set in Lawrenceville, which is one of the Pittsburgh neighborhoods. Um, the second team uh, made up of Yaakov Yubetsky, Sohi Wu, and Daniel Lee worked on opportunity for all in Braddock, uh, which is another Pittsburgh uh, neighborhood. And the third team uh, made up of Alan Herman, Anu Yavasing, and Jen Sung focused on the sharing economy and quality, increase, increasing quality of life in the neighborhood of East Liberty. So some of the key insights that came from teaching that class is that for students, um, especially design students working on a semester long project, this was a very steep learning curve and they were constantly in information overload. Uh, the, the futures thinking methods were very unfamiliar to them. And in particular, they struggled to link future signals in the present to the future scenarios that they were designing. So they struggled to understand the future signals, link them to forces of change, and then uh, connect them to the benchmark goals um, in the scenarios that they were trying to design. So the struggle that they had led me to develop a, a second class, which I called Introduction to Design the Future. And um, the idea here was to focus on getting deep into the topics necessary to understand the social, technological, economic, environmental, and political forces of change. So we read articles, watched online, online book author talks as the way to get high level understanding of multiple perspectives. Um, the assignments were to take the ideas and perspectives discussed in class and inject those into design the future scenario processes. Um, so there were uh, four assignments that the students worked on and I'll show you uh, some of the student work that they did. So the, um, okay. So the, uh, in the first assignment, um, they focused on alternative worlds and economies and students used two forces of change to create four alternative worlds. Um, here, I'm gonna show you the work of Danita Delce, who is one of my students. And in the alternative world, um, she explored uh, four worlds for the elderly. So a collapse scenario, a robot caregiver scenario, elderly immigration, and immigrant caregivers. And the second project was around uh, three generation persona families. So students focused on generational differences and intergenerational dynamics in year 2050. Uh, Danita uh, focused on uh, techno utopia with robotic caregivers, uh, bionic limbs and autonomous cars. Uh, the third assignment was called sign of the times Students created a normative future, scanned the present for future signals, and then backcast to the present. Uh, Danita chose to explore a desirable future uh, in year 2050 for women uh, in technology. The last uh, project was sustainable lifestyle scenarios. So here students focused on a particular zip code, and then uh, based on current economic and demographic trends linked the present to a desirable future, uh, paying attention to um, uh, uh, for, uh, global forces of change and trying to localize those in a particular zip code, how they might play out. Uh, Danita focused on the future of Chinatown in San Francisco in year 2050. So from the um, Introduction to design the future, uh, students were still, uh, some of the things that I learned were that students were still in information overload. And this time it was more about, um, through the seminar part of the class, uh, being exposed to so many topics uh, was uh, somewhat overwhelming for them. And then uh, they seemed to be very familiar with dystopian futures, um, but unfamiliar with normative futures or good futures, desirable futures. And I think part of the difficulty was that they had three hard tasks at once, uh, engaging with the content, learning new methods, and then on top of that, making uh, 
future scenarios. So uh, I was reminded of a, of a lesson that uh, one of my professors taught me, which was one hard thing at a time. And so that, that idea led me to develop a third course, um, which I called a design features seminar. And the idea here is we would focus on one hard thing, which was to take a future scenario developed by uh, professionals and start to pick it apart, start to understand how they work, how are they linked to forces of change and so forth. And um, so in the seminar, students, there was an online component where students learned the content uh, through interactive questions and watching videos and they'd get feedback in real time. And then we came together to uh, do workshops. And so uh, they studied Learn 2050, which was a, a scenario of the future of learning in the United States uh, developed by Arnold Wasserman. And um, here you see uh, students in a workshop trying to understand how uh, education might become free. Uh, I mean, university education become free in the United States in the year 2050. So some of the insights from the Design Futures Seminar online course with workshop was that it starts to lay the foundations to understand forces of change and it exposes students to expert processes and provides individual practice opportunities uh, with feedback. Uh, this course was piloted um, in fall 2015 and spring 2016. And um, at that point, um, the School of Design asked me, uh, based on the courses, uh, the three courses that I'd developed, if I'd be willing to develop uh, a course, uh, which I'm calling Design Futures, um, that would be for all the undergraduate uh, students in design. So the, the three courses that I described previously were, were elective courses and they were open to both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, whereas the Design Futures class that I'm gonna talk about now was required of all um, design, uh, third year design students. And it was taught to 40 or 50 students at a time. So not as a, a studio class, but more as a lecture class. Um, my question going into that class was how might design thinking and futures thinking be taught uh, to designers? And in a 80 minute class uh, twice a week um, with uh, 40 to 50 students. And so I looked to the flipped uh, pedagogy. And so the idea behind flipped is that there's an online interactive homework where students get uh, feedback, correctness feedback. And then you come into class and you do active uh, workshop type stuff. And the flipped classroom was developed for math and science education. Since this was the design course, I added a third component, which is based on reflective practice. And so there was a reflection and then um, online and then discussion in class to really help the students consolidate their thinking and the new methods that they were learning to embed them into their uh, design practice. Now, the, um, this is what it might look like. So students do an online uh, interactive class. Uh, there's videos that they would watch, answer, uh, they'd answer questions about the videos or read something and answer questions and come in and it's a workshop type activity where students work in small groups to try to apply what they've learned uh, to design um, briefs. And by the end of class, they might have uh, worked something out on a whiteboard and so forth. So uh, the Design Futures uh, class, I've taught it in two different ways. There's a 15 week version of the course in which uh, we focus on uh, four main units. So the first unit is understanding narratives of the future. Uh, the second unit is um, understanding alternative futures, third unit normative futures. And then the fourth unit is uh, enacting an experiential future in which students take a scenario and they bring it to life. Um, then I also developed a seven week version of the design and futures class, uh, which is based on three main units, um, why design futures, alternative futures, and looking at multiple futures. Um, the seven week course is then combined with a class that uh, Professor Stuart Candy teaches on experiential futures. Um, so, this is just a, an, an overview of how the weeks are uh, taught um, for the Design Futures 15-week course, um, but today I'll focus on the seven-week course. 
um, a seven week course. And just to give you an example of uh, one of the case studies that the students do, um, I'll talk about uh, a sustainable city called Mazdar, which is in the uh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And so Mazdar is the backdrop within which students learn about uh, steep forces, so that's social, technological, economic, and environmental and political forces. And they use that to, to try to make sense of, of Mazdar. And then also they use Mazdar as a backdrop in which to design uh, innovative products, services, and environments for everyday life um, in Mazdar, should that become uh, uh, expanded and more than just a pilot. Um, so here are some images from Mazdar. Um, it's interesting uh, place for students to uh, explore uh, because it's the strangest city that they've ever seen. Um, there's uh, self-driving buses, uh, self-driving uh, personal transporters. And the students start to explore Mazdar, trying to understand like what would, what are some problems that they see with Mazdar? And they use the steep framework to find opportunities. Um, so uh, here uh, they're trying to imagine what it's like uh, to live um, in, in Mazdar. What are some of the problems that they might have? Then they start to brainstorm concepts uh, for products and services to solve the problems that they've identified. Um, and then uh, they sketch these out. Um, and so this is a, a way for them to explore how steep forces make, might shape, uh, change the way that they're thinking about uh, their design process and come up with ideas that they wouldn't otherwise have. So then the, the next step, of course, is once they have these concepts and ideas, is to critique them. And so, but how do you critique um, an image of the future? And so here is where uh, we turn to uh, futurist um, Jamey Casho, who had a talk on uh, bad futurism in which he goes on to list um, all the hallmarks that he sees of, of bad futurism. And so through that, uh, we use the questions that Casho would ask uh, if he were giving a critique uh, to the students. So this is an opportunity for the students to look critically uh, through their uh, image of the future and try to understand what, what are some of the problems, what are sort of the shortcomings. And that of course uh, leads to revising their current uh, product and uh, coming up with a, a new version of it. Uh, there's more to this assignment. Um, they also take their product into the generic images of the future of gym data. And so they imagine how would their product do if it, if it were in a continued growth, if Mazdar were to go into a continued growth type uh, scenario, or if Mazdar were to go into a collapse scenario, how would their product work out? Or if Mazdar were to become more of a disciplined society or a transformative society. And so again, they're trying to understand how these ideas of futures uh, shift the way they think about what they're making and allow them to think more broadly about where the context where their products uh, might be used. So um, lessons learned uh, from a design futures flipped classroom, uh, students practiced futures thinking with uh, simple design briefs and the reflection helped the students to connect futures uh, thinking to design. Some students struggled to transfer uh, what they were learning in the futures class uh, the, to traditional uh, studio courses. So students understood in theory what the connections were, but then they were uh, struggling to bring these new methods into their studio because they weren't quite sure um, what their studio teacher would think of such ideas. And so the current work that I'm doing uh, right now is exploring how to link the design futures activities directly to studio courses. And um, I've, uh, I've brought uh, particular methods into studio classes that I teach. And so I, and I've seen that it has been quite successful. So now it's the question of bridging the design features class to the studio classes and um, working with the um, 
uh, studio professors to figure out how we might align uh, what's going on in these two classes. So uh, this semester, I'm of course teaching uh, design futures uh, through Zoom. And um, so the, the dynamics have changed a little bit. Um, um, and instead of working on whiteboards, uh, they're using Google Slides to work out their um, projects together. And I'll have new insights about that. Uh, Design Futures is also an open source project. So um, all the course materials that I've developed um, are, are available on the Design Futures website. I've also been collaborating with professors around the world. So Professor Fuzi Young at Tsinghua University, uh, Professor Carl DeSolvo at Georgia Tech and Anna, Professor Ana Barbara at the Polytechnic of Milano have been taking some of the methods and uh, ideas from Design Futures and embedding them in their own courses and testing um, as well. So um, um, here are all the course uh, materials. Um, I, I was really privileged to teach a workshop at Xinhua in 2018. And one of the projects that's come out of that um, workshop is uh, with uh, Professor Fu and, uh, and Ching. Um, we're working on creating a Zutang X a version of uh, Design Future. So I'm super excited about moving that project forward with them. And um, so let me just wrap up and say that um, we should focus on reality to engage with problems. Uh, the second thing is engage with long-term values and vision goals uh, through our design. Um, the third is uh, to continue to learn and invent new ways to design. And the fourth, I think, is to really align short-term design with long-term goals so that uh, we can get there. And last, I'd say um, share what you learned so that we can all learn together from each other. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for Professor Scoopley to sharing the teaching to design filters. Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> and uh, let me introduce the next panel. Oh, here. Sorry. <laughs> so now, uh, today's keynote speech had been finished. Let's come to uh, the panel two, Future Theory, moderated by Professor Shi Danqing. Shi Danqing uh, is the Vice Director, PhD, and the Associate Professor of Department of Information of Art and Design at the Academy of Arts and Design, Tsinghua University. And he is also a new media artist. Uh, let's welcome Professor Shu to chair the panel. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. hello. Hold on a second. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, <clears throat> hello everyone, good evening. Maybe also good morning to to the audience and the speakers from uh, from the United States and uh, all over the world. Uh, my name is Dan Ching. Uh, I'm the moderator of panel two. The title of panel two is called Future Theory. Um, we're going to integrate the future thinking into design method. But I think not only the theory, I think the speakers will uh, share their ideas, uh, also <coughs> theories, also the practices. Uh, so we have five speakers, uh, but four panels. Uh, <coughs> so the, we're going to have Professor Fei Jun from uh, Central Academy of Fine Arts, Professor Susan Yelavich from Parsons School of Design, and Professor Terry Irwin from Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, Bruce Tarp and Stephanie Tarp, uh, Tarp from University of Michigan 
<clears throat> so as you can see, we our uh, keywords of this conference that is called future. I think it's uh, going to be a very unique experience that we are sharing ideas across the countries, across the time zone. I think in China, we are almost 12 or 13 hours ahead of the United States. So it's end of Saturday, but it's beginning of the Saturday on the other side of the world. So we're in the future. And uh, <clears throat> so and it's gonna be very interesting that we can talk and sharing ideas and uh, uh, to, to give uh, to, to our audience. So let's welcome our first speaker, Professor Fei Jun. He is the professor in art and technology program, the School of Design at Central Academy of Fine Arts, who was also my teacher back um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, he is also chief creative director of MoGT Interactive. Let's uh, welcome Fei Jun. And his topic is interdisciplinary context and the practice of art and the technology. Professor Fei. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, Professor Fei. I saw Professor Fei. Oh, oh. not here. I can call him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fei Lao is there. Hmm, yes. But. 没有声音。Yes, he didn't open his microphone, so I'll call him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. We are back. So, uh, uh, oh, maybe we can make Susan first. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, while uh, we are waiting for Professor Fei, uh, Let's uh, <clears throat> let's move on. Uh, professor Susan Yelovich, she is a professor at Design Studies, Parsons School of Design, the new school. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it tonight, but uh, kindly she recorded a video and uh, to give her speech over the video. So let me move to. Can you see the video? Yes, I can see. Okay, I just play the video and we can. Okay, okay. Hello, my name is Susan Yelovich and I'm a professor emerita of design studies at Parsons School of Design in New York. Um, it's a pleasure to be included in the International Conference on Design Futures and I want to thank professors Fu, Barbara, and Scupieri for including me. It's an honor. Title of my talk is Bequests. The future is a shapeshifter. On the one hand, it's empty, waiting to be filled. On the other, it's already packed. Ask anyone about the future, and they'll have a scenario or two to share with you. 
only a month ago, or months ago, rather, sorry, back in March, I'm betting that most of our thoughts about the future mm -hmm. had to work on plans with colleagues, friends, and relatives, planning vacations, conferences, birthday celebrations, and the like. That all changed in 2020 with the coronavirus. The virus uh, and the rising tides of climate crises, not to mention social crises of racism and nationalism, have all but wiped out small futures, leaving gargantuan and fearsome ones in their place. Given the broad rise in depression and anxiety documented in these last months, the shift from small to big futures has happened, not just in the minds of thought leaders, activists, and designers, but also in the popular imagination. The future may be ours, but who wants it? Certainly not the far right, which would have us enter a time machine and go back to 1950 when women and persons of color knew their place. But no amount of magical thinking can shield us from the ultimate future, death. It's this realization or denial, literally brought home by the coronavirus pandemic, that has made the future much less abstract. It's time to write our wills. And I don't say this lightly, as you will see. But first, a bit of history. For much of the 20th century, where I spent the first 50 years of my life, the future, in design and art circles, was embodied in an avant-garde and celebrated an uncelebrated modernist who made it tangible in sculpture, paintings, uh, performances. These modernists, from Russian constructivists like Elzitsky to American design inventors like Buckminster Fuller, drew, modeled, built, and staged utopian visions that were meant to be free from the encumbrances and the flaws of the past. They wanted to build the future sui generis, in other words, from nothing, as if that were even possible. It's useful to remember that we owe the very concept of the future to such expressions of modernity. But it's also important to remember that Elzitsky's agitprop sculptures and Bucky Fuller's geodesic domes were part of a much larger zeitgeist that had been developing since the 1700s. In concert with similar developments in music, literature, art, architecture, technology, and philosophy, design's contributions to modernity and its cult of speed, for speed, think of telegraphs, telephones, railroads, and airplanes, and automatic everything. Design's contributions were meant to be, quote, compensations for the loss of the organic continuity of the past. That's from Clive Dilnot, design scholar. In other words, the expectation of better things to come and come sooner replaced the predictable and stable character of rituals and behaviors that had been governed for centuries by their seasons. Increasingly, life was determined by the artificial, in other words, by design. Just think about the difference made by electric lighting. When the architect Eric Mendelssohn put electric signage on the exterior of the Schocke department store in Stuttgart in 1926, he changed night into day. Faith in technology replaced faith in miracles. But the future's compensations, among them more time to shop, have backfired. We no longer know where to put the casualties of our future making. All those things we bought and bought into are clogging our homes, our landfills, our oceans, even outer space, which incidentally now has a fleet of archaeologists studying the debris that we've shot up into the thermosphere. And of course, the effects of our profligacy can't solely be measured in terms of the quantity of rubble we produce, be it from endless wars or wasteful consumption. It must also be measured in terms of species extinction, including theoretically our own. All of this makes it very hard to look forward to the future. Once the source of fantasies in which even dystopias were thrilling, the future has become a palpable burden. Among designers, it is gospel that this is a burden they must assume. But to do so requires another endangered species, optimism. Not the naive optimism of flying cars, new and improved appliances, or any of the digital animisms that have infiltrated our lives, but the optimism which is intrinsic to design itself. Fundamentally, one cannot be motivated to design or act in any way without hope of an outcome. Once that optimism expressed itself in the configuration of the new. Today, however, it arises in the process of reconfiguration. The reconfiguration of materials, social relationships, politics, culture, and cultures all of which operate in different temporalities, one of them being the future. 
The shift from configuring to reconfiguring flows directly from the fact that designers recognize their work as consequences far into the future. Their work sticks around and needs to be reconfigured if we're not going to suffocate under its weight. As you well know, for the first time in history, human behavior governs the environment. Nature and nurture are no longer distinct. And by nurture, I mean design, the design of literal things, as well as the design of systems of things. If we accept this larger notion of design and accept that it operates in a web of power and politics, it follows that practicing designers need to expand their purview in order for their work to have any effect at all. Otherwise, it will be strangled the way things, by the way things have always been done. But before we shift the blame to, editor, to external forces who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, we also have to admit that the design industry itself, whether fashion or building, has had a major role in creating the patterns of waste and pollution that currently characterize our condition. Thus, it follows that professional design, the traditional categories of graphic design, product design, architecture, and design as world making, addressed by service design, transition design, and social design, both have roles to play in redressing our condition. As you can tell from that last observation, I'm not ready to throw the baby that is design as conventionally practiced out with the bathwater or give in to unspoken rivalries about what constitutes the best way to practice design. In my fantasy of design's future, two modes of designing would be better integrated, these two modes, so that when radical structural change happens, aesthetics, by which I mean the senses, are not abandoned. I sometimes worry that while designers are becoming increasingly adept at working with social scientists, they are becoming less adept at working with each other, working within the culture of design itself. That said, I'm optimistic that designing structural change and the design of artifacts, spaces, and communications involved in accomplishing that change will become complementary and not contradictory approaches in acting towards the future. Acting towards the future in the present means that instead of inventing the future, designers of conscience, no matter what they call themselves, need to excavate and reassess what we bring to it. To put it bluntly, designers are now rewriting our last wills and testaments. I use the metaphor not fatalistically, but hopefully, because wills are acts of generosity and caring. Made while we are living, they compel us to consider what we are bequeathing to those who live after us. But let me be clear though, design for the future needs to be thought of as a communal will and designers need to be both witnesses and co-authors. The witness role will already be familiar to those who work with communities as facilitators of conversations that lead to actions, which may or may not be tangible. The role of the co-author is closer to that of the traditional designers. They propose to make forms and situations and actively shape a dialogue about what might be included in the collective will. Of course, these distinctions between traditional and new are not hard and fast, as you will see. But before we get to any examples, I want to assure you that making a will, as I'm using the term, is not the sole prerogative of the privileged. While most wills cover private property and personal possessions, and of course money, the collective will has no prerequisite of wealth. For example, you can be living in destitute conditions, in a refugee camp or a blighted city neighborhood that are devoid of natural beauty and still wish for others to enjoy it in the future. In her book on beauty and being just, the humanist scholar Elaine Scarry poses a thought problem, which I will paraphrase. Quote, thinking not of ourselves, but of people who will be alive at the end of the 21st century, would you wish for the continuous existence of plants and blossoms, even if you have none of your own? End quote. She and I believe that the, most people would answer yes. So a will can be made by someone who has nothing. Of course, wishing for and actually delivering the goods to the future, be they plants and blossoms or a home that isn't a refugee tent, are radically different propositions. Designers can contribute what's missing from the wishing, namely pathways. Without pathways, our social and physical landscapes remain a directionless whole. Pathways offer options with which to consider the future. I like the metaphor of pathway because it doesn't sound as finite as the word design, though certainly pathways are designed with various methodologies, and I propose we consider some now. 
My first example isn't so much a pathway or a means to seeding the future, as it is a method that is fundamental to every form of design, including futuring, and that is iteration. One of the most relevant demonstrations of the expansive power of scenario building I've ever come across is to be found in David Eagleman's book, 40 Tales of the Afterlives. Actually, the full title is SUM, S-U-M, 40 Tales of the Afterlives. In it, he conjures 40 possibilities of what we might experience after death. This would be just a silly exercise if it weren't for the fact that each of his tales shows how the future is predetermined by our lives on Earth. In a tale called Encore, we learn that our creators are talented only at creating. Quote, they do not watch our lives unfold. They couldn't care less, end quote. What they do is wait for our lives to end and recreate them from our data. Quote, they take it as a challenge to see if they can recover a good likeness of a person from the piles of evidence they've left behind. Namely, phone records, credit card receipts, ATM withdrawals, magazine subscriptions, tax returns, and every other form you've ever filled out. The recreators construct a, can reconstruct a person so seamlessly that their afterlife is essentially a perfect replica of the original, end quote. This is a future to which we have bequeathed our virtual selves, our digital doppelgangers, which were accumulating all the while we were living. Moreover, we knew it was happening, but did nothing to stop it. This is a will that could have been rewritten, but had only we thought to do so. In another story called Micro, this is the iterative part, <laughs> each changes. Um, in Micro, we die and our bodies decompose into teeming floods of microbes that, microbes that return to the earth. It seems there is no God that cared, of us, cared about us as an entire individual. But in fact, in this scenario, God is a bacterium, a bacterium that is unaware of us because we are at the wrong spatial scale. God and his microbial constituents have no idea of the rich social life we have developed, just as we are unaware of theirs. This is a future to which we have bequeathed our ignorance of biology, and the story reminds us we would do well to consider how germs run the world, especially in the era of COVID. Of course, projections like Eagleman's, taken from our behaviors in the present, are the foundation of almost all science fiction, as my fellow presenter Bruce Sterling will no doubt attest. And as useful as these fictions are in helping us think about long-term risks in overlooking things like virtual surveillance and microscopic forms of life and death, designers need other tools. One, which I find especially relevant, came to my attention courtesy of the aforementioned Mr. Sterling, and it's called pace layering. As the word pace suggests, the concept is about pacing or rates of movement. Anyone consciously trying to affect and perhaps change things for the better in the future would do well to be aware of the layers of time or pacing in which designers, and anyone else for that matter, must operate. This is because we need to be aware of the systemic forces that, for all our good design intentions, produce inertia and slow change down. I'm thinking of forces like government regulations, for example. Now, if you want to read about all six pace layers, fashion, commerce, politics, infrastructure, culture, and nature, you can read Bruce's essay, Pace Layers, in my book, Design is Future Making. But for our purposes, I want to concentrate on just one layer, and that is culture, because it's stubborn and the hardest to change. What increasing numbers of designers have learned is that they may not be able to change culture. That can take decades, even centuries but they might open up different opportunities within existing cultures by drawing on insights from anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and members of the culture in question themselves. In doing so, they can alter cultural legacies. Let's take an example from Colombia, South America. Colombia has suffered continuing armed conflict since 1964. One of the horrors of any war, civil or otherwise, is it's the violence per Pepper, sorry, the violence perpetuated against women. It is, was particularly bad in Colombia and probably still is because the fighting has started again in certain places. Here we are dealing not just with the socio-political conflict between the government and the rebels known as FARC, but a long history that goes well beyond Colombia. The history of a cultural acceptance that women are less than human, that rape is a soldier's reward, and that women are acceptable targets for masculine rage. I am aware of several design projects that have tried to address this web of abuse and misogyny. 
in hopes of restoring dignity and peace. But I want to talk about a particularly exemplary effort to address Colombia's future in light of this broad cultural bias against women by using another dimension of Colombian culture, in this case, press. I learned about this project from Maria Puig de la Bella Casa. She is the author of Matters of Care and a professor in science, technology, and organization at the University of Leicester in England. More to our point, she is a co-investigator in a project called Mending the New, a framework for reconciliation through testimonial digital textiles. She and her colleagues have been working with communities which have been crafting textiles for centuries. Communities of women that have recently been severely affected by military violence. Maria tells me that rather than just documenting memories of war, the textile crafting she and her team work on generates spaces of common reflection that has a healing, restorative, and constructive potential that negotiates between memory and reconciliation. The textile crafting she's talking about involves many people, uh, most important being the women affected by the war. Essentially what happens is the women gather in kitchens and homes, they tell their stories to each other while they're weaving. Those stories are recorded with their permission on digital fibers supplied by the designers, which the women incorporate into the cloth they're making. When finished, each cloth can be activated so that others can hear their stories as well. And the textiles are traded from community to community. The women are the authors of their stories, while the designers contribute organizational skills, bringing the women together, technical expertise, adding sound to an otherwise mute piece of cloth. In essence, the age-old practice of oral history is amplified by the introduction of technology design. And in the process, these weavings become the women's wills. The thing I find most moving about this project is that it combines another culture's haptic traditions, weaving, and its oral approach to storytelling with designers' digital ways of sharing stories. In other words, it respectfully combines traditional ways of making with contemporary technology in order to bequeath these women's stories to their daughters. Another approach to making a will for the future that I believe is more along the lines of what most people think of when they think of design futuring is the process of co-envisioning. This process, which another one of your guests, Nick Bairton, is especially gifted at, um, is going to be talked about by him. But I work with Nick and Virginia, his partner, and their colleague, Elisa Bertolotti, so I know something about their approach to co-creating possible futures, and I can't... Um, resist sharing this one and one of their older projects. So it won't hopefully be repeating anything that talks about. Um, you can find it in my book, Thinking Design Through Literature, if you're interested. At any rate, this project is called Welcome to Sarang. It's a storytelling project that Nick's team led to encourage social innovation in a neighborhood in the Belgian city of Sarang. This is a city that was once famous for its steel industry and is now facing very severe socioeconomic challenges. In collaboration with a local puppeteer, the design team worked to foster new forms of civil participation. As it was explained to me, the anarchic character of the puppet theater allowed a tremendous freedom in encouraging audience participation. Specifically, it gave the puppeteer the freedom to make the voice of the outspoken working class character called Chanches to be forthright and honest and to introduce other characters such as the devil representing the private owners of industries who have pulled out of Sarang and the white fairy representing the designers who have come into Sarang with good intentions, but a great deal of naivete. Designers take note, humor is much welcome in your work. Furthermore, an anonymous local hero was created as a surrogate for each and every inhabitant of the neighborhood. Storylines of the puppetry performance were co-created with the inhabitants of the neighborhood via a storytelling workshop developed with a design team and based on the team's engagement with inhabitants during the field research. Now, what you just heard is a fair summary of what happened, um, but it's strategies and tactics. So the strategy was using puppets as surrogate citizens. The tactic was using humor to engage an audience in what would have been a tedious civic exercise for some people. I also want to point out, though, that there was a larger premise at work here, which is designing in a way that redistributes power. Making the designer seem a bit silly was a stroke of brilliance. It takes the power away from the know-it-all designer and, and bequeaths some of it to the citizens, shares it with the citizens. Another important point is the project's reliance on a very old form of design, the puppet. 
Not only did the puppets literally act out different sources of power within the community with an eye to distributing that power more evenly, they were also vivid and effective mediators by virtue of being familiar to the community. This combination of what I will call old-fashioned object design, namely the puppets, with service and systems design, namely the conversations with the community, is precisely what is needed to gain the trust of people who are well outside the culture of design thinking, with its over-reliance on post-it notes, brainstorming, and, uh, and abstractions. This integrative design process is very similar to the previous example I just offered from Columbia. Both projects involve coping with the past towards the goal of a more humane future. But while weaving done by the women in Colombia incorporates very specific and personal stories of violence, the conversations engendered in Serang were more open-ended. They encouraged the city's residents to think both poetically and practically. For example, in another phase of the project, Team member Elisa Bertolotti set up a table outdoors to make business cards for jobs that people wished they had. One man said he wanted to be a postman, a postman who only delivers good news. In this case, what is being willed are hopeful pathways around toward a future that is more than just safe and secure, but also psychologically and spiritually fulfilling. Of course, approaching the future in the ways that I've described also requires a different understanding of time itself. As increasing numbers of designers recognize, design is embroiled in systems that operate in a different space-time dynamic than the one they practice in. Consider the environment. The particular of our buildings, our kitchen appliances, and our food containers continue to live, as it were, in new forms that collect in the ocean, in our drinking water, in our bodies, and in the bodies of other sentient and sentient creatures. Well, insentient means a stone, object, but they are affected. Um, all that is solid doesn't melt into air. It morphs into different solids. But for too many people who can't see the destruction that is happening in the present, there seems to be little motivation to act for the future. We are not hardwired to look out the window, see the sun shining and the trees swaying in the breeze and go, oh, yeah, I'm in the middle of a climate crisis. Moreover, we are too easily distracted by a 24-7 news cycle another destroyer of time. But before we lay the blame on contemporary media, it's worth noting that human beings have been historically forgetful. As the poet Petrarch wrote in the 14th century, quote, anything present is accessible for the minutest fraction of time and then escapes perception. And consequently, foolish people think that it ceases to be relevant to us or ceases to be ours. This oblivion presents, prevents life being a unity of past events woven with present ones. It divides yesterday from today as if they were distinct and likewise treats tomorrow as different from today. Now the behavior of forgetfulness may be ancient, but it is also true that coming to terms with time is far more complicated today than it was when Petrarch was writing. <laughs> to paraphrase Anna Barber, one of your conference organizers, the future is already present in the ways we inhabit spaces by virtue of the media within those spaces. Conventional spatial coordinates are being warped by speed and the ubiquity of the digital. Another very important thinker on the effects of speed, once valued for making the future closer, is the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman. In his book, Liquid Modernity, Bauman writes that speed has frayed our social relationships and diminished our any sense of security in our working lives. We live in a culture of distraction. Bauman warns of its dangers, writing, people who do not have even a modicum of a hold on their present, much less the past, as they don't, given the shapelessness of experience, those people will not muster the courage to get a hold on the future. You could also say that his is an argument against traditional futuring which as Petrarch observed, creates a state of oblivion. This is why designers are rethinking the ways we narrate our experiences and just as importantly, our joint histories. So in addition to designing wills that offer ways to share experiences as with the women in Colombia and reshape them for the future generations as in Serang, we need to include a codicile, a modification to the will, which ensures that we pass on this more nuanced under understanding of time Time is not an arrow going forward. It's more like a DNA helix with dominant and recessive genes. 
Now, if you don't remember your high school biology, an example of a recessive gene would be a trait like red hair or blue eyes that only appear sporadically and unpredictably throughout the generations of a family. With the metaphor of recessive genes in mind, we also have to accept that there will always be unknown variables that we cannot envision, anticipate, or design for. The best illustration of this aspect of the future, namely its unpredictability, can be found in the films of Todd Twyker. In each of his movies, the plot revolves around a minuscule change in routine, usually a change that has devastating consequences. Just to give one example, in his film Heaven from 2002, a woman sees when we do something differently, we do it respectfully. It's humbling to think that even the most thoughtful and generous design is always vulnerable to arbitrary and unexpected forces, which by defi definition happen in the future. It would be hubris to think otherwise, but it's no excuse to despair or to take no action. Our bequests will certainly be susceptible to unpredictable events, and they may well be late in coming. But that doesn't absolve us of our debt to the future. Drawing on both tangible design practices and intangible design methods. Timing. So the present, the present is the future of the past. So uh, she made a lot of uh, examples that uh, through the history, how uh, historically people think what is the future and what is uh, going on right now, like then predict what's the future, what's the design uh, of the future and the future going to be. So uh, another topic is called big, uh, big quests. So uh, okay, thank you. So uh, let's move back to Professor Fei Jun. <coughs> Hello, Fei is there? 在了,在了,这回可以听见吗?啊,可以听见。那么下一个speakers,so uh, uh, okay, let's welcome Professor Fei Jun. Uh, he is professor in Art and Technology Program, School of Design, Central Academy of Fine Arts, also the Chief Creative Director of MoGT Interactive. The topic, uh, Professor Fei brought to us is called interdisciplinary context and practice of art and technology.正常的看到我共享的屏幕吧可以看到可以看到好的抱歉刚才出现了一点声音上的问题非常感谢有这个机会在设计未来的这样一个国际论坛跟大家分享我个人包括我作为教育者在央美这些年来在一些科技领域的
to establish the architecture of uh, the discipline. This uh, graph shows why we need to have uh, a cross-disciplinary development. The center shows awareness. In other words, to uh, put it uh, in a simple definition, the awareness uh, revolution has uh, promoted the establishment of a uh, new disciplinary structure. In other words, the art and the technology, this uh, discipline is mainly developed by the industrial development. Uh, we have uh, print industry which related to the graphic design, like uh, uh, garment design. And also we have uh, the um, home appliance sector which related to the furniture design. In the information era and uh, intelligent uh, era, when we are undergoing major changes, we must uh, use a new context to view this world. The awareness revolution also includes the uh, biological existence, including human beings and also the environment and uh, our uh, perception. This kind of uh, perception helps to promote uh, a number of areas, for example, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, smart home. And more important, it has uh, generated a number of uh, new uh, disciplines, like the biological machinery discipline and effective uh, computing and uh, synthetic uh, neurobiology. Here, uh, we have uh, various dimensions, uh, metaphysical and physical, they have uh, interdependence with each other. So the outer circle science, art, design, engineering cannot be fully divided, but they have an internal cycle. Art is a, a study of the environment related to human beings. In life, through observation, art establishes our perception of human beings and environment, and this perception also helps to seek for the truth scientifically. Then, those principles and rules of the world and the truth we identified will further advance the engineering solutions, which via design make more specific so that humans could apply it to our life. Then the products and services design will develop a new life uh, style, for example, mobile phone. And this uh, lifestyle will um, go again to the artistic development and artistic uh, critique, which forms a new cycle. So this uh, creation cycle is the basis in four areas, we are um, developing the study and the research of uh, art and the technology. One is the art technology and art. Second, robot technology and art. Third, the intelligent technology and art, and also data technology and art. Related to that, we have also developed some joint labs and uh, courses Due to time limit, I cannot go to the details here. Next, I'd like to talk about the impact of design and designers. First, regarding the creative value. Artists in the future practice will 
not only be the creation of a uh, aesthetic value, but through art and uh, technology, the value of uh, technology ethics will be generated. In today's world, everyone needs to have in-depth understanding of the change brought by technology and the technology itself. We should not be the user of technology only, but also the participant in technological advancement. In other words, ethics will be the core value brought by artists. The second one is uh, the change of uh, field. Artists and the designers, traditionally speaking, work in physical reality based on material object or a field. Then with the hybrid reality, we are embracing a virtual reality supported by virtual technology, ah, physical technology. And this will lead to the change of the artistic language. The third will be the change of the method. The studio-centered artistic practice will be changed to cross-disciplinary practice based in lab. Of course, the lab will not only be limited to the physical space, it can also be a way of working on um, cross-disciplinary practice. And then last but not least, the change of uh, output for hundreds, even thousand years, art uh, output is a uh, kind of an image or object. But nowadays we'll see more and more artistic forms which will be shifted from um, image and objects to system and uh, algorithm. So that will be non-object based. For example, a lot of uh, digital art can be regarded as a system created. And the algorithm will no longer serve as a tool only, but also become the essence of art. The art and the science education in Central Academy of Fine Art has been launched for five years. And in 2019, it has become the 22nd VA program. So we need the uh, cross-disciplinary program to encourage creative uh, strategy, technical competency, and critical thinking skills for students. This compound capability is not only about uh, technology, but for both art and technology, we need these uh, multi-layer capabilities. So next, I will share with you some of uh, the practice of my students for my own in this full aspect to trigger further discussion on art and uh, technology. First, this is uh, art plus uh, robot technology. It is created by our undergraduate student called Dark Capsule. From this uh, image, you can see there are many live uh, uh, insects like uh, snails and uh, flies. They will be identified by various uh, software. The activity of the insects will drive those uh, instruments to play. In other words, this is an uh, insect driven insect concert. The of this project, to some extent, demonstrates that these uh, new capabilities are nurtured with multidisciplinary approach from the idea centralization to the design of software, hardware, and installation. 
of this can be completed by the student. But five years ago, this was uh, unimaginable. And uh, second case, a postgraduate student uh, output is called evolution machine through genetic algorithm. They try to generate a more optimal poster for running and working. You may think it is too funny, but by algorithm, this would be more optimized based in the future. So it's a quite an interesting approach, which not only generate the result, but also apply it to the machines. And in this video, you can see the result of this algorithm to drive the actual skeleton to move. When I guide this student, I can see the artificial man in this uh, software is not uh, the student himself, but his father, which means he's not uh, fully confident about this project. The second part is the art plus intelligent technology. Research is the project I created for Venice by Annie, which cannot be exhibited in Chinese uh, uh, exhibition. It uh, required the participant to download the app in Venice and uh, with the application to scan the 25 uh, bridges in Venice. When the mobile will show a Chinese bridge similar to the structure, and through VR, we experience the scenario created by multimedia method. We used machine learning, including virtual reality, to set up the connection between the two civilizations by the similarity connection comparison just to demonstrate that uh, we have uh, focused too much on the differences between similarities uh, between civilizations uh, and ignore the similarities. And the interesting world installation too is also exhibited in the Chinese hall. It adapted the artificial intelligence technology to talk about uh, man and machine on site. You will see on site, you will see your own image is tagged. Actually, the logic is this uh, AI program will base on the experience, uh, visual expression, the color of a clothes of uh, one or more participants to set up a logic and uh, provide a narrative of uh, individuals, for example, bring you to Venice by any or any other corner in the world. The man, the object, uh, the scenario will be connected. Why this is a machine intelligence caused uh, by artificial intelligence? Because uh, here we are not uh, interested in using artificial intelligence to uh, write or paint like uh, human beings, but with the uh, computing capability and expanded capability of a uh, machine to break uh, the boundary of um, human creation, we could uh, uh, further extend this uh, capability. It seems to be random creation. However, internally, there's a lot of a connection in between the narrative. Here, you can see the subtitles at the bottom of the screen is a poem written from perspective of AI. 
It does. I connect to you randomly, ignoring your emotion. I just know the funny algorithm is my spirit. Just、uh, abandon your noble thinking. Let me guide you to、uh, enter into a new way of a journey. How we completed this、uh, logic? I have captured one、um, example. The program captured this、uh, man in yellow and.、Uh, Bring him to the outside. The first scenario he reaches is the grave with the yellow flowers. You can see the color would be the key link. Surprisingly, after this scenario, he is being shown a video covering this flower. Where we can see a hand is uh, uh, removing the pieces of the flower. So this is a very poetic and unique image connection, like a video or film created by machine and coding. It cannot be completed by one individual, but through the machine intelligence and algorithm, various uh, uh, magic connected scenarios are linked. So this is、uh, the new creation brought by machine. Then art and、uh, biological technology. I will share with you two examples. One is.、Uh, My student Liang Huan created this green tank. This machine will、uh, provide the soup for you. The source material is、uh, your saliva, and、uh, through certain receipt and、uh, genetic modification, you will be served the. Very tasty too. You may think it's very funny, but actually, genetic engineering industry will be a major disruption to our future. And also,、um, during his、uh, postgraduate study, he have another project called Imi Plant Urban Wetlands Project, which focuses on the waste land in city. Which during his、uh, survey found both biodiversity. This、uh, neglected ecosystem could provide an imaginable biological value regarding air purification and biodiversity. So through this way, he has completed his、uh, plan, wild land plan. Hopefully, the public make a contribution to the biodiversity. Another project by my PhD student、uh, Chiu Yu. The project is called the microbial sound organ. Through the biology at the bottom and the sound device at the top, we could hear the sound of the microbial. We have a more、uh, personal feeling during the pandemic. We very much hope to hear the voice of、uh, the virus so that we could identify a solution to it. Let's see the possibility of combining with digital. This is、uh, the work of、uh, the bachelors uh, uh, of the undergraduates. Uh, the work is the is to harvest the、uh, biological data of a person. For example, the way you uh move your arm and、uh, the way you move your waist, the uh data from your body, and then come up with、uh, the essays and uh, the, uh, formulate uh, an algorithm. With this algorithm, uh, com combine your 
clothing and your body, they can write an uh, write a poem for you. This is uh, the poem that that is generated in real time because every time the data from your body is different are different, so uh, you will have uh, different versions of a poem. Maybe your body is more creative than your brain, and uh, this piece of work displays to us that uh, in this information era, we rarely pay attention to the creativity of our body. And uh, this student uh, with uh, the cross disciplinary education. And this student can express himself with software and uh, the hardware. The clothing as uh, the, uh, the vehicle of the traditional uh, craft, he can combine the software with uh, the hardware. Uh, I'd like to share with you uh, a project I worked with uh, two scientists. Xu Chen Yang is a, a, a famous uh, mathematics, and Liu Zhengkui is uh, the scientist in psychology from Chinese Academy of uh, Science. We want to come up with uh, the project that to express with geometry and uh, mathematics and algorithm of emotion to express ourselves with this ways the audience could touch a trigger in the dark chamber and generate a series of data and they have the algorithm for the emotion and then they can uh, come up with uh, the the the, uh, the geometry that express the emotion of uh, those who touched the trigger and uh, the circles represent the extroverted person and there are cubes it represents a more introverted personality and in the middle there are some cone like uh, shapes represents the personality while you look introverted but actually you are extroverted every uh, person at that moment had different status of emotion and the emotion could be expressed by those geometric shapes. The last one I want to share with you is the Garden of Homing Birds. And that is uh, the piece of work for the Daxing Airport. This is uh, the uh, digital artifact and this is at the arrival area and the, the passengers will see uh, the birds that are flying back as a gesture of uh, welcoming the returning passengers when you go closer they will not um, fly away there will be more birds that coming to these passengers. For every arriving flight, there will be a bird that are carrying the flight number arriving at this area. And this picture will change according to the changes of uh, the seasons and uh, the weather. It is uh, not a virtual world. It's uh, something that helps us to feel the close ties between human and uh, the nature. Then that is the life that's brought about by the digital technology. And here we can see this is a scenario in spring, in summer, in different seasons. 
different plants and flowers will grow in different seasons. Lastly, I'd like to end by saying that in this time of uh, cross disciplinary education, not only we look at uh, what science could bring to arts, but more importantly, we need to study what can arts bring to science. And I think that is uh, the uh, the core to the topic that we're talking about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Fei, for your wonderful presentation about your uh, the experiences in your educational and creation activities. I'd like to ask you a question. We can see that uh, the uh, works from the students of your department, they uh, have uh, uh, very profound meanings. We've uh, seen the case studies. Did they teach themselves the technologies and uh, how could they have access to the technologies? How do they work with uh, the one who knows the technologies? This is a very good question. So they uh, there is a big challenge to educate science to the art students, especially in the uh, school that is dedicated to arts. How do we solve these challenges? There are three things. First of all, uh, at the first year, we do not have uh, the uh, courses like uh, the uh, programming in the second year and the third year. We uh, add the, uh, the courses about technologies gradually. Our own ability in technologies cannot support, fully support their art creation. We have to work with the uh, science and technology schools and the colleges to invite uh, the outside teachers or facilities to provide the students with uh, the uh, necessary support, but it's still far from enough to uh, accommodate all the technological needs of the students. So at the time of the creation, we built the infrastructure or scaffold for the students and uh, match with the students' own resources so that uh, they can complete their creation. In another word, uh, technology is not the key. Uh, we are teaching the methodologies and the way of thinking, not the technology per se. We also have uh, the courses for uh, the basic technologies. But we think for the students at this level, they need to understand the logics of a transdisciplinary creation. When they have the basics, they know that they can connect with something bigger and find something that match with their own work. And that is the core competitiveness of the students. Thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing. We shall continue with our uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Let's welcome Professor Terry Irwin. She is the professor and director of Transition Design Institute and Carnegie Mellon University. The topic Professor Terry brought to us is called Transition Design, the long-term future as context for weak problems in the present. So uh, Professor Irwin. Hello. Okay. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Now it's your time. 
Uh, it's about 20 minutes uh, before nine o'clock in the morning here. Okay, have a good morning. So uh, uh, we're moving on and it's your time and you can, if you have uh, uh, slides, you can share your screen. Okay, thank you so much. I'll do that now. Do you see birds flying? Yes. Okay, warm, great. Warm. Okay. Well, first of all, let me thank you and all of the organizers there for inviting me to speak at the conference today. It's an honor. I'm going to talk today about design futures within the context of transition design, a new area of transdisciplinary design focus which is aimed at addressing wicked problems and catalyzing systems level change. I'm also going to argue that the long-term future must be part of a radically large context within which wicked problems must be framed. Transition design argues that wicked problems are barriers to transitioning our organizations, communities, and societies toward long-term sustainable futures. Urban planners, Rattel and Weber, call these problems wicked because of challenging characteristics like these. Every wicked problem is unique and constantly changing. There are multiple stakeholders with conflicting agendas who have no clear shared problem definition. These problems straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries, and every wicked problem is connected to other wicked problems. And wicked problems are things like this income inequality, climate change, terrorism, loss of biodiversity, lack of access to affordable housing and education. And as we're seeing right now in my country, things like pandemics, racism, and police brutality. These interrelated interdependent problems form what we call problem clusters, which makes them even more intractable. Transition design argues that wicked problem clusters like this must be framed within radically large spatio-temporal contexts. And yet, most traditional problem-solving approaches do exactly the opposite. They begin this way. Our client or funding organization identifies a clear manageable problem like a lack of funding for a soup kitchen here in Pittsburgh. Numerous solutions will be explored and we might finally design and implement a multi-pronged fundraising campaign or app that enables restaurants to easily donate food to the soup kitchen. And a few months later, we're done and we get to declare, declare success because indeed more money came in the door to feed more people. But guess what? Next year, the problem will still be there and the process will start all over again. Sound familiar? But what if, what if from the beginning we asked whether this predefined problem was really a symptom of a much larger problem? What if we begin to expand the problem frame and trace the problem's roots up to higher systems levels? When we do, we see that the soup kitchen is connected to a lack of services for homeless people at the higher level. So we redefine the problem as not enough homeless shelters in Pittsburgh. But if we go up yet another level, we eventually arrive here. Homelessness in Pittsburgh, and that is a big wicked problem. But wait, it gets worse. Remember I said most wicked problems are connected to other wicked problems? Well, if you view problems related to homelessness as part of the larger context, it begins to look something like this. And this is the point at which we realize that no single individual or discipline can solve a wicked problem. It requires diverse and radical collaboration over long arcs of time to effectively address it. And it takes one more very important thing, a better understanding of systems themselves, how they behave and how they transition over time. Essentially, we all need to become students of systems, but first we have to define what we mean by the term system. And that is perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other and one says, how's the water? And the other says, what water? Marshall McLuhan famously said that one thing fish know nothing about is water, 
since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them are so pervasive, we don't really see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. My work is concerned with how we learn to see systems and understand how they behave. So we live in a world of systems nested within systems nested within systems. There are transportation systems, infrastructural systems, financial, economic, and communication systems, and all of these are permeated by cultural and disciplinary norms, laws and informal practices, or ways of doing things. And together, all of these form what is known as a socio-technical system which are the large spatio-temporal context for all of our wicked problems. And these systems are always in transition. But despite their constant movement, socio-technical systems are highly resistant to change. They get set in their ways, just like we do. But change they can, as a result of three things, large and small events, technological innovations and breakthroughs, and changes in beliefs, social norms and practices. So in both material and non-material ways. And any of these changes can happen suddenly or gradually. But it's important to also remember that human societies are always in transition. But these transitions have been largely unintentional, full of drift, and we only understand their ramifications in hindsight. We call it history. The question before all of us in the 21st century is whether we can intentionally transition our societies and organizations toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable long-term futures. Because transition design argues that the long-term futures we're currently transitioning toward aren't necessarily the futures we want. But it contends that we can intentionally change these transition trajectories toward futures we do want. Now, I know it sounds like an impossible undertaking, but if we use the current situation to think about transition trajectories, we see that all of these countries started out at more or less the same place. And we've learned that small changes in the present can make a big difference in where you end up in the future. Transition design is essentially an approach to intentionally shift transition trajectories and this is where the future becomes a crucial part of the problem frame. We need to agree on what we're transitioning toward. And here's how it works. Most traditional approaches focus on doing research to understand the problem in the present and then begin to immediately solve it, often hoping that there is one silver bullet solution. Transition design argues that before we can resolve a wicked problem, we must understand how it began. So we go back in time to research how and why the problem began. And we use a framework called the multi-level perspective or MLP to understand how systems and systems problems form and become wicked over dozens of decades or even centuries. Our research almost always reveals insights from the past that can inform solutions in the present. So this step extends the problem frame quite a bit, but not enough. Wicked problems took a long time to become wicked, and they will take a long time to resolve, which is actually a solutioning process of transitioning toward a long-term desirable future, a future in which the problem has been resolved. Transition design argues that we need compelling visions of that long-term future that can act as powerful motivators to action in the present, and that these visions must be co-created by the stakeholders affected by the problem. Now we have a radically large problem frame that includes the past, the present, and the future. But we also have to think about how we transition from the problematic present to the desired long-term future. Backcasting from the future to the present creates a transition pathway, along which ecologies of systems interventions or solutions become steps toward that desired future. But let's look a bit closer at, at a step that attempts to integrate the future 
into solutions in the present. If the future vision gives us a narrative about where we want to go, we also need to develop a narrative about how to get there. So we develop a series of milestones that describe that transition. We do this not because we think we can predict the future, but because we want to learn to think rigorously about the process of transition itself, to explore possibilities and probabilities. And together, the long-term vision and the milestones describing the transition create a powerful narrative that, as I said before, can motivate action in the present. But our ultimate objective is to integrate these ideas about the future into solutions in the present. So before we develop those ecologies of systems interventions, we ask, is the future already here? And William Gibson said it is. He argues that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So we look for signs of the future vision in the present. And these might be future fragments or pieces of the vision. And these future fragments can become the basis for solutions in the present. So ecologies of systems interventions that are informed by or based upon these future fragments ensure that our solutioning in the present is always informed by and on a trajectory toward the desired long-term future. We've been developing an online, online workshops in transition design that have two objectives. First, to introduce participants to systems principles, how systems work and how they change and transition over long periods of time. And second, to introduce an applied approach to addressing wicked problems and catalyzing societal transitions toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable long-term futures. Participants work through the steps I've already discussed, but in particular, I wanted to show you the templates related to visioning, or a few of the templates. This template challenges participants to develop facets of a vision of a long-term future in which the problem, in this case, COVID-19 in the US has been solved. The Domains of Everyday Life is a framework by Kossoff for considering the organic systems levels of which everyday life is comprised, the household, the neighborhood, the city, the region, and the planet, which challenge and force us to develop integrated solutions that are not siloed and bound to specific disciplines. To begin, participants develop facets or glimpses of the long-term future in which in this problem, zoonotic viruses are not frequent and pandemic, but rather rare and contained. Here we see that the household has become the hub of everyday life and is more multi multifunctional than it is today. It has become a place where people work, study, play, grow food and socialize on a regular basis, and architects now design living spaces to support these new patterns of living. Households and neighborhoods have now become connected in new ways that can serve and share resources such as childcare and the growing of food and strengthen the social fabric in symbiotic ways, resulting in a greater sense of self-sufficiency and resiliency when challenged by an outside force such as a pandemic. At the city level, most businesses now have a significant number of people working at home and mayors around the country have formed cooperative confederations that strengthen infrastructure throughout the country. Their Greening Cities Initiative has established green belts and wildlife preserves around cities for several miles, which has halted deforestation, which has prevented the spread of pandemics and has reduced global warming and air pollution. The effort is supported at the regional level by shifting mindsets connected to plant-based diets and a greater concern for the welfare of the environment and other species. At the planetary level, most countries have given sovereign rights to members of the ecosystem and things like factory farming, pollution of waterways, or even zoos are seen as things of the past, relics of early 21st century societies. When all of these post-its are brought together, it forms a powerful future-based narrative that integrates the concerns and hopes of all stakeholder groups affected by the problem because they've created the vision together. 
Narratives like this serve as motivators to action, but also a roadmap that guides systems interventions on that transition pathway between the problematic present and the desired long-term future. This is the template for developing milestones along the transition pathway that describe the years or decades long transition toward the vision. The milestones describe a general situation at different points in time along that transition pathway and challenge participants to think deeply and rigorously about the process of change and transition itself. And we often have uh, participants work at either end of that transition spectrum, um, asking in the first step, what does it look, what does that first step toward the desired future look like? What gradual changes move us toward the vision? What shifts in attitudes, new practices, or policies are taking place? On the opposite end, they ask, what would the future look like right before that vision had been attained? At this milestone, a lot would have changed, but there would still be things that needed to happen. Finally, the middle milestone needs to knit those two ends together. Sometimes teams imagine a large negative event as a tipping point or phase transition that changes things for the better. Like the visioning exercise, the post-its together create a narrative about the future. The milestones create the narrative about the decades long intentional transition. The best example we know of is really Jonathan Port's book, The World We Made, which has excellent examples of milestones and narratives about long-term transitions. This final template has two, the two parts we mentioned before, future finding and designing interventions. Future finding is a step based upon Gibson's argument that the future's here. So we look around for fragments that relate to our long-term vision and milestones, both for inspiration and the seeds of what can become systems interventions. For COVID-19, ideas such as universal basic income, the new ways in which we're inhabiting our homes, and new practices such as wearing masks may all be part of what the future holds in store. We also see the scientific community working differently, sharing information about the virus in real time rather than relying on journals with a year's lag time as the only way to disseminate information. And the ability to work from home is changing our ideas about where we live and whether we have to commute. We look for these future fragments that are connected, again, to either the vision or the milestone, and we then move on to use some of them as a basis for interventions. So once the teams have found these future fragments, they begin the final step. This matrix challenges them to design entire ecologies of systems interventions that are connected to each other and the vision and the milestone. The vertical axis shows us the categories from the problem map that um, you saw in the first template. Where, and that tells us where change needs to happen. The horizontal axis helps us situate the interventions at the right level of scale. The most important thing to emphasize is that it will take multiple interventions at multiple levels of scale connected to each other, no one-off solutions, please, and a long-term vision to resolve a wicked problem. The other thing to note is that these interventions are aimed at changing both material and non-material issues. Sometimes changing mindsets, beliefs, practices, and behaviors or reframing an argument is the most powerful leverage point for change. And this is what the futures piece of the transition design workshop looks like. There's a pre-phase in mapping the problem and mapping its historic evolution, but we encourage a lot of connection making between these templates as up to 60 people are working in Moreau to complete these workshops. The final point that I'll make is that visioning, and therefore the future, is part of an ongoing cycle of problem mapping, long-term visioning, and system solutioning. Because as we intervene in these systems and the systems respond, we must continue to update the visions so that they remain vital, relevant, equitable, 
and are able to inform solutions in the present, which we need to get feedback from. The overall objective, again, is to intentionally shift transition trajectories via the resolution of wicked problems. So the problem map I showed you today is available on my academia.edu website, um, along with many other resources. Our seminar for doctoral students in transition design is an open source website that has a lot of readings and downloadable um, teaching materials that are being accessed by educators and practitioners in about 20 universities worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Irwin. Uh, maybe I can have a, a short question. Uh, <clears throat> as we know, the year 2020 is a really a year of weak problems, right? And uh, um, I, my question is, um, because you mentioned that the problems is in uh, the systems nest in each other is going to be very complicated. And to solve the problem, uh, the transition designers has to have some intervention to the system, but how much power they have to have because it's going to be political, economic, uh, technology. It's really a big thing. Uh, does the transition design need, need to gain power? For example, if a transition designer is going to be elected as the president of the United States, what he or she could do following your theory. That's my weak problem, yeah. uh, weak problem question. Yeah. Well, it's a really good question. And there's a whole nother lecture I give uh, about how transition design is non-expert design. It really argues that it changes the role of designers and other uh, experts that come to a system. It changes our postures from one of being experts and bringers of solutions to being um, in service of the system. So what we set up is a process where the stakeholders themselves are very, very involved in mapping the problem in beginning to understand the problem. And transition design sees itself as bringing resources to the community in which the problem exists so that we can grow actors from within the system and leverage the knowledge that already exists in the system. The thing about expert design or the thing about any kind of expert discipline is we as outside experts will always come and go. So our job when it comes to wicked problems, which will take decades to resolve, is to create the continuity within the system so that the community itself can pass the baton. And by community, I mean not only the people on the ground experiencing it, but all the levels of infrastructure in between. So the city government, nonprofits, various infrastructural departments. So our job is to help create a framework that will give them longevity over decades in order that the continuity remains there. As a designer of 40 years, I worked on large projects my entire entire life, sometimes for years at a time, but we always left. So I think the challenge for transition designers is to work with other experts to build capacity within the system so that they're the ones that are leading the solutioning. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your speech. We have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's move on. So our last panel, panel, <coughs> uh, let me see. So let me introduce uh, our last session, uh, Professor Bruce Tarp and uh, Professor Stephanie Tarp. They are both from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, so, hello, Stephanie. Hello, Bruce. Hi, we're here. <laughs> hello, good to see you. 
Good so, to see you. Uh, yeah, I think it's your time, and uh, I will hand over the microphone to your side. And if you want to share the screen, you can start share screen sharing. So the topic Bruce and Stephanie brought to us is called design futures and the discursive design. That's welcome. Okay. Can you see the title slide, everybody? Yes. Yeah. You're good. Good. All right. Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting. So actually, it's been really, um, uh, really nice to sort of see the other speakers, even though it was very early when we were very early in the morning when uh, we started. Um, but thank you very much. It's uh, uh, really a great pleasure for us to do this. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm I'm Bruce Tharp, and this is Stephanie Tharp. And we're, we're navigating two two computers as well, too. So yeah, and thanks for staying up so late. <laughs> we know um, those of you in in China are, are it's very late there. So um, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Stephanie Tharp, and I have a background in mechanical engineering and industrial design. And I have taught at two different schools. One was in Chicago, the University of Illinois Chicago School of Design, and then moved here to Stamps um, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in 2014. Yeah. And uh, my background is in mechanical engineering, industrial design. Um, and so we have that same foundation stuffing I do. Um, and then additionally, I have a background in um, sociocultural anthropology. And my teaching uh, began with a, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and then moving on to the School of Design to, to, uh, at UIC to join Stephanie there. And uh, as she mentioned, uh, we're both now together here at the University of Michigan. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a project that we have been working on for a number of years, which culminated in a book published in 2019 entitled Discursive Design. And in this book, we introduce language, framework, and tools and we think this can be helpful for futures design practice. We'll go through some of the language and tools that the book introduces through the nine facets. And we'll be looking at and using drones as artifacts that exemplify these ideas. So as design's role in society has expanded, various ideas-based design practices have emerged, such as critical design. Some you may be familiar with here and some maybe not. Uh, some have more Prevalent ones are critical design, speculative design, design fiction, adversarial design, and there's many more. So while these all have unique qualities and differentiating features, these forms of design are all tools for thinking. Rather than utility or aesthetics, their ultimate aim is to inspire reflection. So this diagram, like a genus species diagram, visualizes that discourse is a unifying idea that links these practices together. So, um so we're defining a discursive design as a, a means uh, where artifacts uh, address substantive uh, psychological, sociological, ideological topics. And, and see, the, these are ideas and issues that we're, we consider discourses. So um, this is a form of discourse through design and design artifacts. And we define discourse as systems of thought or knowledge. So it's not just any idea or concept, um, and, but uh, ones that uh, we're probably uh, familiar with in terms of uh, this, like gun control, childhood obesity, uh, climate change, genetic engineering, immigration, animal rights, that type of thing. So di discursive design uses objects as tools to facilitate um, reflection and conversation around these substantive topics. Um, and so this is uh, the vision, uh, is a vision of the future, an urban hub for drone traffic uh, or a drone port. Now this project, it, it assumes that a drone port is important and that we should, and we should be moving toward this uh, or something like it. It focuses not on questions of why, but of, of how. And it assumes that the drone port is justified. It's just, quote, a suggestion along a, produ a product roadmap, as uh, Clive Van Herden uh, put it earlier this morning or earlier today in, in your time zone. Um, while this is a valid form of futures work, um, it's not as relevant to discursive design. It still is to some extent, but not quite as uh, relevant. Um, discursive design is not about you know, selling a future. Uh, but instead, it's about uh, provocation and probing values, beliefs, and attitudes about, uh, you know, the futures that we might want to move toward or uh, run very quickly uh, away from. 
So the one example of this of the kind of discursive work that we're talking about is drone aviary by Super, Superflux, which is a, um, a known project, so you might be familiar with it. These drones provoke an attempt to give a glimpse into a near future city cohabitating with intelligent semi-autonomous networked flying machines. So this is a cautionary tale. It hints at a world where the network begins to gain physical autonomy, moving through and making decisions about the world, influencing our lives in opaque yet profound ways. So, so through our research, we've uh, created tools, frameworks, and language to help designers create artifacts that enable reflection. So in many ways, that like what uh, Tara Erwin was uh, just presenting, um, the idea that there are sort of theories about how to actually, how to actually practice. And uh, so we see these tools as being able to support designers who are doing futures work. And while we'll be using um, examples of drones, as Stephanie mentioned, as sort of a common theme for our talk, and it's sort of, it's a nod to the future. Uh, the issues being unpacked are not inherently about drones themselves. Um, they're much broader than that. So the drone is sort of the vehicle to elicit some of these uh, other these other ideas. Um, while we will have drones in the future, we will certainly also be dealing with topics of state surveillance, violence, tr data transparency, gender equality, civic participation, civic enforcement, and consumer culture. So these are all topics that our drone examples are going to bring up today. So this is a um, this image shows the content map, and the blue highlights the the nine facets that I mentioned that we will um, that we will discuss. So moving in. So these are these nine facets provide a structure for discursive designing, and this structure does share a lot in common with other design processes. So these interrelating facets provide a framework that can guide design development and were derived from analysis and looking at a lot of this kind of work over a number of years. So the first one, intention. So what is a designer to do? So we view the designer's intention as the initial guiding force that influences all subsequent design decisions. So this helps the designer get straight on what you're doing and why you're doing it. If you're straight on what you're doing, you'll be more effective and more efficient. And some of the um, language that's introduced through this area in the book are uh, mindsets and aims. So mindsets are listed here, and these are commonly mentioned in many different innovation models. And these are also based on research that we did with um, in looking at the different work, um, describing the most typical attitudes that designers have when approaching discursive work. Another thing that's introduced here are aims. So remind, inform, provoke, inspire, and persuade. And this also comes out of um, asking people about the intentionality from, in de from designers when talking about their own work. So to provide a, a drone related example, so we showed an example previously, drone aviary. So that one was more provocation. Here's an example, um, this one's called drone survival guide. This is more discursive through informing. So it's an informational poster about drones and it seeks to raise discussion about surveillance. The guide indicates the nationality of the drones and whether they're used for surveillance only or if they're used for deadly force. This next one, um, the backside of the poster shows information about hiding from drones and hacking drones. And then the poster itself is made of a reflective material, which is a technique that can interfere with drone sensors. The next area is has to do with understanding the content or the discourse that you're working with. So in the same way that a commercial designer needs to understand more about users, if you're designing a kidney dialysis machine, for example, you need to understand more about that context in order to design effectively. With the capacity to affect individual thinking comes a responsibility to know more about the discourses being conveyed. When designers have greater understanding, their designing and disseminating are more effective and more efficient. Especially when designers address external discourses and audiences beyond design, they need to understand and convey this proficiency in order to be seen as credible. Additionally, it's important to be ethic ethically responsible in the work and understanding contributes to this as well. And it also contributes to the e efficacy of a design. And um, this is an example, this is called Drones Plus. This is by Josh Begley. It's a simple iPhone app that sends a push notification every time a US drone strike was reported in the news. And um, this was uh, through the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. He spent months manually reading articles of every single drone attack in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. And this allowed him to gain a deep understanding as well as credibility in doing this project. Okay, so 
Um, the next facet is message, and um, especially in the form of product design. So this facet is uh, different from commercial and other forms of design. Um, it's because a discursive design is fundamentally, it's always communicative. Um, it wants to affect the, the intellect. Um, so there, we, this notion of messaging is there. So we emphasize um, with this, uh, the idea of message content. Um, which is essentially the you know the discourse that's being um, uh, uh, communicated, um, and 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 this the, this really has no bounds. And in fact, this is what's powerful about this mode is that designers can uh, begin to get involved with lots of different discourses and topics and arena, and sort of increase their par their social participation. Um, but we also introduce um, something called the idea of message forms, and this is drawn from composition theory. So this is different. Um, it's a, it, it's, this is the different form that a message could take, like analysis, description, comparison, narration, et cetera. So we can have messages and they are about different things, but they're also structured in different ways as well. And our research in, is, that, um, is that careful consideration for how message content is crafted in a specific message form before being shaped um, as an object, that that uh, can improve the likelihood that discourse is um, communicated uh, effectively and, and efficiently. So uh, message forms um, can be this sort of a generative ideational tool. And that's the way we see this and how um, it's mostly used is, is, a, is a generative ideational tool. So uh, a project, a dome project that sort of uh, addresses this uh, to some extent. This project, uh, there is called, it's called This Drone, uh, and it's by Molly Lofton, um, and it engenders a discourse about how, how society views women um, in terms of travel, outdoor adventure, and, and independence. And this is a particular concern of her. She uh, lives in Colorado and is, sort of does a lot of this type of activity. Um, so she, uh, part of this project is um, this, uh, she created this satirical feminized drone. And you can see features like uh, menstruation detection alongside bear spray attachment, uh, and this is, addresses the idea about extra caution against animal tax that uh, women who are menstruating should take when they're hiking in the woods. Um, so if we look at the artifact um, uh, and how the artifact relates to the message, the result seems to be uh, closest to the message form of comparison. Um, so the female features of this drone um, are implicitly compared to a more typical drone, likely you know masculine in aesthetics and also and also functionality. So the next uh, facet is scenario. So how does the designer set the stage for reflection? So the discursive scenario is the story that supports the different conditions and future being suggested by the work. Discursive design presents a scenario, often with the message. The designer sets the stage for the audience by creating artifacts, describing their users, and communicating the context. It's important to communicate the framing of the project by situating the work. Something to mention here is implicit scenario versus explicit, explicit scenario. So in an explicit scenario, a designer uses videos, narratives, storyboards, and narration. And in an implicit scenario, this refers to cases where the artifact assumes the bulk of the narrative or the evocative responsibility itself. So here the audience engages nearly entirely with the artifact and the scenario emerges from its physicality, aesthetic expression, and semantics. And here's an example of an implicit scenario. This is drone shadow, which is visualizing an invisible presence making the impact of drones visual. So the next is artifact. So what's a designer to make? And with artifacts, so this is about the object itself, there are three types of artifacts, principal, depictive, and explanatory. Principal artifacts are the design objects themselves that are central to the project. You can also create artifacts to help support the story or explain the project, and these are the depictive or explanatory artifacts. An important part of the artifact is the provocative quality. So there are five key dimensions that the designer can play with to increase or decrease provocation. So these clarity, reality, familiarity, veracity, and desirability. So an example, this is a video. This is a project um, called Game of Drones that builds a fictional world in which drones are part of a gamified civic enforcement system. So this is a depictive artifact, which is what the designer prepares or creates to depict or show what's going on. It's a form of visual imagery that helps to tell the story. So hopefully this will play. So 
So here, citizens are playing this game and they're contributing to parking enforcement and getting points for finding people who have parking violations. So this project was presented in a paper and was convincing enough that two out of the three reviewers seemed to believe it was real, despite the author's admission in the conclusion that was a part of a design fiction and therefore a fictional account. So that relates to the level of reality in the design that was links back to the reality of the... Okay, um, and then uh, we can move on to audience. So one of the aspects of discursive design that most distinguishes it from <clears throat> other types of design is its relationship to an audience. So discursive design must speak to some audience, right, because it's a discursive activity with a communicative agenda. So this is audience-centered design as opposed to user-centered design. And, uh, and, and this is sort of an, an important shift um, in doing this kind of work. So confusion can arise because other forms of design have users, but not necessarily an audience. Um, and discursive design, um, it can employ rhetorical use as well as actual use. So those two things can kind of get, you know, mixed up and complicated a little bit. So um, these are um, three primary relationships um, that a designer might choose to leverage when thinking about a project. So in one case where um, you just have an audience. An example of this would be, you know, the, the artifact is sitting on, um, you know, within an exhibition, sitting on a pedestal in an exhibition. There's just an audience there. Uh, the second one is where the audience is aware of some actual use, whether, you know, uh, at, at some previous time or so sort of actually may, they may be witnessing use uh, um, uh, right there and then. And then the last one is where the audience themselves is a user. And all of these have sort of strengths and, and weaknesses, advantages, um, and disadvantages. So an example of one of these, um, so I'm going to go back to uh, the, um, uh, the example that Stephanie had where she mentioned um, Josh Begley's uh, Drones Plus app, you know, where you push and you get a, a push notification every time there's a U.S. drone, drone strike. So this is just a, a quick demonstration of what that looks like. You go to the app, here are your notifications when they occurred. And then you can actually go and see the map where they were, and then a little bit more information about them at that at that time. So originally, uh, this was banned from Apple, though after 12 subsequent tries and over five years, um, he was able to get this approved um, in 2017. So his discourse is about uh, U.S. military power, public awareness of drone strikes, and um, and technology as a tool for state terrorism. Um, so the power of this project comes from, you know, his putting this data right in the audience's hands. So in this, uh, in this case, this is an example of audience as, as, as user. And, um, and then moving on to context. So context is distinguished from scenario, um, where this is the real world environment where the audience meets the discursive work. So the, the idea here is that uh, the dissemination context should be considered as a power me powerful means of supporting or enhancing the discourse or the project's uh, overall impact. So we're encouraging designers to think more broadly, you know, here, you know, the lab, field, showroom, clinics, forums, various marketplaces included, you know, including crowdfunding um, and digital ways, sort of secondary levels of sort of digital engagement um, that could all engender, you know, sort of this potent reflection uh, that we're, we're getting at. So um, we present um, so four dimensions for designers to consider when uh, choosing or to choose to design the dissemination context. So tension, meaning, mood, and management. So as an example of this, um, this is, um, I'm going to play you a video of uh, Liam Young's Electronic Countermeasures Project. So it meets its audience in a, a public outdoor context. So, you know, the field. Um, so we'll see a flock or just two of the flock of GPS enabled drones that broadcast their own local Wi-Fi network. So he calls it a form of aerial Napster. Um, quote, they swarm into formation broadcasting their pirate network and then disperse escaping detection only to reform elsewhere. So 
uh, I'm not sure if you could see in the video the crowd um, that was sort of watching that. But so this is, uh, you know, a, a powerful engagement. So the, the drones enact this sort of ballet like performance at night with these sort of soft glowing lights. And it creates this sort of ominous mood that supports the discourse. Um, and you actually even the, the movie or the the music uh, you know that accompanies the video of that you know is is in, enforcing the same thing. So rather than merely seeing photographs, you know, for example, of his project, the audience was better able to experience the the possibilities of this kind of uh, this or this particular future that he's imagining. So um, interaction. So uh, there are endless forms of possible uh, interactions. Um, and we encourage designers to explore these, you know, more deeply. And, um, and uh, we are introducing a sort of a basic model with really just the three most fundamental ones. There's, there's more with this, um, you know, the, the interaction between artifact user and designer. There's all kinds of contextual stuff, too, that could come into play. But this is what we're, we're focusing on here. Um, and these are various dimensions that are applicable to each one of these legs of the triangle that could help designers think through some of the possibilities. Again, more of an ideational tool to think, you know, how can I best, um, um, how can I best uh, communicate this discourse and get really people to, to reflect on what I, what I want them to do. So um, this is a project called uh, Mr. Drones, and it's by Rajiv Basu. Uh, and he created a mock website for consumer drone purchases. Um, not necessarily these ones, but, it, or, um, but he's sort of po you know, getting at that idea. He's uh, deliberately more provocative. You can see the sort of missiles on, on these drones. But, um, so he has digital tools where the audience can apply their own colors and graphics to the drone and even see how it will, would look flying in different New York City street locations. You can, you can choose different locations, you know, based on, uh, on, on Google Maps and you can see your, um, your, the drone that you design uh, sort of fit in there. And there were even uh, sort of, um, you know, like typical models like this, either different artists have done different, um, uh, um, um, uh, low, you know, different designs that you know you could potentially put on your your purchase. Um, so, so the designer with this kind of engagement um, has uh, increased, you know, the you know it's a greater attention and you know potential for impact of his messaging. You can share, share these on social media, um, and uh, but his message is really about this sort of commodification and uh, the public appropriation of of drones in this case. And again, this is, happens right after a lot of the the um, uh, the uh, this became legal within the United States uh, to, to have publicly owned drones. And so it obviously uh, garnered more uh, attention around this issue. So um, the, the last of these nine facets is impact. And this is about the degree to which the project has promise for or proves out some beneficial result. Uh, this is something that should be considered with the first facet that we talked about intention. So the idea that they kind of bookended, right? You want to start with um, a, a, a sense of where you might actually end up. At least that's what we're suggesting here. Uh, one of the issues that discursive design suffers from is, uh, it, is that it claims uh, that its claims of impacting society are often uh, overstated, right? Um, and we heard a little bit of that, uh, some of the complexities from, from Terry as well. So it's certainly possible that the artifacts could you know, have that kind of broad impact, but that's a pretty tall order. So we're introducing sort of a, a three-step approach to impact for different domains. And we didn't really talk about the domains here, but there are these different domains. So uh, basically these three build on each other um, and the designer loses agency kind of along the way, which is why it's really, um, it becomes very, very challenging. So it's just a different way of thinking that rather than kind of an all or nothing, you know, I, I impacted society or not, uh, this is a way of thinking maybe uh, about um, smaller, smaller goals along the way. And as an example of this, um, this is a, a New York City a gorilla poster design project by SM. So these were placed around New York City as a way of provoking citizens. So indeed, many thousands of people were exposed to these posters and they were eventually pulled down by the authorities. Um, and this is a sign that was part of that same project, again, reaching thousands of, uh, of people. So this likely leads to, um, you know, uh, the increased possibility of impact. Um, you know, more, lots of people saw these, uh, but it's easy to confuse exposure to the messaging uh, with a valuable reflection upon and the impact of the messaging. And one of the challenges for discursive design is measuring impact or knowing that you've 
um, if you've gotten people to reflect and what that overall um, uh, overall effect was. And this is an increasing challenge um, as corporations and uh, institutions get involved with futures work, um, be it more conventional futures work or more, you know, this more probative stuff that we're, you know, like, how, how, how are you, how, how are you uh, making an impact? Are we getting our money's worth from this futures, this futures work? Um, so uh, with these uh, facets, so, so our goal is to give designers more tools with which to create more powerful and successful discursive work. So we're suggesting that um, these are relevant to futures theory, um, but perhaps more importantly, at least for us, uh, futures practice. So theory in, 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 in support of practice. Okay, um, so while design futures work is usually about engendering forms of reflection to some degree, uh, discursive design, be it speculative design, critical design, design fiction, um, it's presented as most helpful when the goal of futures work is more challenging and reflective of social values, beliefs, and attitudes. Certainly there's more to think about regarding people's lives in the future than merely what technology they will use. So, uh, so we hope to give you a glimpse of how the provocativeness and the carefully crafted dissonance uh, that typically that typifies discursive design, how it can support the many possible goals and approaches uh, of design futures. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I can see that drone is one of your main theme or main artifact through your research and the design, I think, or your interest. I wonder, when, because when I was reading your resume, Bruce, there was one line really shining into my eyes. <laughs> you know which one? The military? You, yes, you, you, you served as US Army nuclear weapon officers, captain in Germany. <laughs> that, that, that this uh, experience has something to do with your design interests because uh, you were talking about discursive design and using uh, the, the drone as one, one main example and talking about uh, the relationship between designer, users, even audience. I, I think, could you talk a little bit more the choices? Why drone? <laughs> well, I'm actually glad you didn't um, invoke the possibility that our, that our present would be a, a discursive designer. Uh, the way you mentioned the possibility of a, a transition designer. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I did spend time in the military and um, uh, and we chose drones. I, I didn't work in a, in a capacity where we were using drones at all. Um, the choice for drones was largely because it's there, there are actually a lot of projects about the drones and drones are uh, part of this, um, a, lar a, a large part of this sort of future imaginary. Um, and for us, it was a way of, of looking at something that was connected to or, or often associated with themes um, and discussions of the future, uh, but in a way, uh, uh, the, the examples that we chose were less about the drone specifically and what uh, the, the values, attitudes, and beliefs around drones um, that, they, that, you know, that these projects surface. So, um, so it's actually less, um, certainly less about um, uh, Actually, our research is not about drones in, in any way. Uh, yeah. We're using drones as just a way to basically help bring out some of these, um, these ideas. Okay, cool. Understood. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have pretty thoughtful and uh, uh, night. And uh, thank you for all of you. Thank, uh, let me, hold on. Okay, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, I can hand over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks to Professor Shi and all the speakers of panel Future Theory. Uh, all the speech of today have been finished, and uh, I'm glad to introduce the rest act activities of International Conference on Design Futures. Uh, as you see, tomorrow we will have two ideas labs on speculative future and the future of education, uh, which are only in Chinese. And the next Saturday, 
On November 14th, there will be four keynotes and two panels like today, which are both in Chinese and uh, English. And uh, on next Sunday, there will be another two ideas labs on future communication and the future city. Um, we look forward you uh, to watching the rest of the con conference. So if you want to know more about this conference, please follow the official account of our WeChat. So that's all of today. Uh, see you tomorrow and have a good night. See you. See you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Say it, Jan. Say it, Jan.